Today, I have the great privilege of introducing a distinguished guest who's played a pivotal role in shaping the landscape of advertising and marketing. It's my pleasure to welcome Sir Martin Sorrell, the executive chairman at S4 Capital, to our LinkedIn studio. I thought you were talking about somebody else. I, we're, I'm talking at about in, you. At least in my mother's mind or, <laughs> or my mind, but nobody else's. Well, we're, we're so happy to have you here. Good to Thank be here. Thank you for joining us. It's like trying to get into MI5, actually. Did you, did, here, but, yeah. but, you, but you made Wrist it in. Wristbands and everything else. Anyway, yeah. Big performance. Anyway, go on. <laughs> yeah, but here, here we, we are. Made we made it. Yeah. We made it. Okay, so we have to talk about it. And I, let me give a little bit of background for people who may not know. So you were founder and CEO of WPP for... And before that, Saatchi's, actually. You know, I was CFO at Saatchi's and Saatchi. So, so I've had three... Three existences, three okay. lives. We'll go. Let's go on a, a bit of a journey. Yeah. So, speaking about WPP, and you can tell us more sure. about the other elements. So, you built it from a one million pound shell company in 1985. Correct anything I, yeah, I, no, that's I fine. say. That's fine. To the world's largest marketing and advertising services company. Yeah. When you left in 2018, it had a market capitalization of over 16 billion pounds. Yeah. Revenues of over 15 billion pounds, profits of approximately 2 billion, and over 200,000. Yeah, that's a bit. Is that? On the number of people, it was about 130,000 directly employed, and then okay. about another 70 where we had interests over 20%, between 20 and 50%. So it was about 200,000. Okay. I, I looked at it as being, you know, if you think the average family unit is about three, three people maybe more. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's actually getting less. It's one of the things that Elon, Elon Musk worries about. Certainly you know, a trend. He wants people to propagate more. <laughs> but you know, I looked at it as being probably about half a million people that depended in one way or another for their living at, at WPP. You know, at S4, we have uh, approximately 9,000 people. So it's probably about 27,000 or 30,000 people that are, that are dependent in some way for their for their living on, on, on S4 or medium, medium monks, mm -hmm. as we, we call our operating brand. So I think I look at it that way. And you know, when one thinks about it that way, creating employment was probably, when people say, what's the purpose? Mm -hmm. um, I often used to answer it as creating employment. And at which in today's world, you know, threatened according to some people by existentially by AI or AGI, Obviously, becoming and we will, even, I do even want to more talk pertinent. About that. We'll come on to that. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, creating employment, yeah. I think, is a powerful purpose and anchor yeah, and not driver. Many, not many people sort of put it in that way, actually. I mean, they obviously talk about purpose in many other ways, but I think fundamentally that's probably, and it's it's top of the agenda now because if you went back to the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes wrote, mm -hmm. I think it was in 1933, that automation or industrialization would result in unemployment and we'd all be taking more holidays. Now everybody is focused a lot, not totally, but a lot on what the impact of AI and AGI will be on employment. So actually, I think that, that purpose or that point will move even more to the top of the agenda. I mean, I very interestingly, more. I did a, 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 a session with uh, Scaram Anthony Scaramucci in London, and uh, a, a mother came up with her daughter. Her daughter worked at one of the holding companies. Mm -hmm. And mother said to me, is my daughter going to lose, she was creative, was she going to lose her job? So uh, there is this fear. I mean, AI, AGI engenders wonder, you know, about what's going to happen. and the impact, and it is considerable already. We can go into that in more detail. But at the same time, it engenders fear. It so does. So people, people are worried about it. Well, let's, let's, let's actually go to it. Sure. Let's go there. Because you know, I think there are probably a number of different lessons you've learned yeah. over the different iterations yeah. um, create, with creating employment. So many people are concerned, and there's a lot of uncertainty yeah. about what the impact of AI and gener generative AI will be yeah. on the workplace. You know what you you actually called um, AI an industrial revolution that yeah. you think will be net positive yeah. for the world. Yeah, I, I mean, mean how did, tell us a little bit more about how you got to that thing. Well, uh, I mean, just let's back up for a minute and okay. and, and um, you know, Sarge's was about globalization. So 
Um, you know, to my mind, there are two things that people should think about in relation to our industry. One is the sort of geographical bucket, and put it that way, and the other is the technological bucket. And if I go back to when I started in 1977, so it really dates me, I'm, you know, an old fart. Um, that was about, you know, Ted Levitt, who was a famous marketing professor at Harvard Business School, wrote in October of 1983, I think it was, in the Harvard Business Review, that mm -hmm. consumers would consume everything in the same way everywhere. So that really, it wasn't the trigger for globalization, but he recognized it. You know, those days, Proctor probably 10%. When I was at Harvard Business School, 66 to 8, Proctor was generating about 10% of its revenues from outside the United States and was regarded as being a, a global mastodon. And it was at the beginning of it. So Sarchus was about that. WPP was about the continuation of that, you know, Manhattan Landing, BA's famous ad, mm -hmm. which wasn't Ridley Scott, but whoever the producer, you know, one of those people that went on to Hollywood from, from film, uh, commercial film production. Um, but it was about globalization. And then, of course, with, with WPP, in the 1990s, we saw the growth of the internet. I, mean, I was interviewed by the Harvard Business Review in, in 1997 when we started talking really about the growth of digital in, in, in a business. S4 now is about primarily about technology, but geography is changing. I mean, the world is becoming much more fragmented. I think we're going into a, if it's not a de-globalization era, it's very close to it. And geographical fragmentation and the balance of power uh, is shifting. I mean, it's no longer a US Western dominated world. Uh, it is, you know, bipolar or multipolar. Um, and obviously China, you know, if we look at 2050, uh, the per forecast, China will be the world's mm -hmm. largest economy, not on a per capita basis, but GDP as a whole. US will be second, India will be third. Indonesia will be fourth or Germany will be fourth and fifth will be either Indonesia or Germany. So if you think about it in sort of Premier League terms, football terms, three of the top five are going to be Asian. So the world, you know, the, it's, the world is shifting from a geographical point Same. of view. And of course, the technological bucket driven by AI and AGI. So that's the background to it. Um, as far as AI, AGI's impact, we're already seeing significant impact in a number of areas. There are probably five that are really important. The first is copywriting uh, and visualization. So that's accelerating. So Huge. what took us two weeks can take us literally hours. So productivity benefits are huge. Second is hyper-personalization at scale. So the Netflix model, as I always call it, which is you know data generating content. You know, we're doing a series for Netflix you know, one and a half million creative executions, we'll now be able mm -hmm. to do more, even more. We go to market as fast and better, cheaper, and we've added the word more to it because AI enables us to do things the at Netflix at cessation, scale. if you yes. can make a word. That yes. model is Netflix. going to become yeah. even mm -hmm. more important. You know, not perfecting TV ads over three or six months period in multi-locations at great expense. We could do it with the Unreal Engine, interestingly, from New Delhi, using the Fortnite technology Fortnite game the technology called the Unreal Engine. We know we could we could do commercials anywhere in the world. So it was already there. So hyper personalization. Thirdly, media planning and buying. You know, why depend putting it crudely, why depend on a 25-year-old media planner or buyer when an algorithm will work? So we will be working with mm -hmm. the platforms, using the signals from the platforms, using first party data to inform the development of creative content and, and through media planning and buying, mm -hmm. so it'll become much more algorithmic. Fourthly, using AI as a super tool, as we call it, so to improve processes, our own processes and client processes. And the fifth area, which I think is the most exciting, but most people disagree with this, so don't highlight it, is using the knowledge across the firm. So firm companies are going to become much more uh, horizontal mm -hmm. and less vertical. And power within companies is going to be diminished, control is going to be diminished by everybody being able to have access to knowledge across the That's interesting. The so that, that aspect is not something I had heard anyone speak about. Can you say a little bit well, more okay. about so, the, so So the guy who, who left DeepMind and Google, I think his name was Clinton, 
was interviewed by the BBC um, was for why he left Google. Uh, and he was worried about the existential threat of AI or AGI. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if you had 10,000 bots, you know, we have 9,000 people or approximately in our company, so let's say 9,000 bots. Every bot would know what the other 8,999 bots were thinking and knew. And what AI will empower, it will empower our people to know. I mean, if you, if you said to me, what drives me nuts? What drives me nuts is when somebody in our organization says, I didn't know that we did that, or I didn't know that, that we huge, were there. That is a huge problem. Right, a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So getting, getting the 9,000 human bots, right, to know everyone, to know what the other 8,999 know is critically important. And knowledge inside companies is power, and, and people build vertical sort of power bases. Based and, on knowledge. Yeah, and you know, one of our fundamental principles, you know, we're, we're digital only, we're data driven, we're faster, better, cheaper, and more, and we have a unitary model, so one P&L, that's what we, we get, not multi-branded. And you're speaking about, this is, everything you're talking about are things you're doing at S4. Four, that's right, and that, right that unitary model will be enhanced by AI and AGI to a terrific degree. If we ingest all the data into our chatbot uh, and we disseminate it and give open access to our people, they in theory will know everything. You know, when, I was at, when we did the so-called hostile takeover of JWEC in 1987, they had a thing called the Thompson Yellow Pages, you know, Joe Walter yeah. Thompson Yellow Pages, and that was a telephone directory of what everybody in the company knew from a you know, capability point of view, a client point of view, a geographic point of view. Um, and me and my wisdom thought it was too expensive and we scrapped it. They used to update it every three, it was on paper, mm -hmm. every three months. In a way, what AI is enabling us to do is to resuscitate the Thomas and Yellow pages, but in a much more sophisticated technological form so that everybody has access to it. So on the assumption that the data that you, that is ingested or propagated is accurate, and over time it becomes better and better, mm -hmm. we will get perfect knowledge, you know, or, not, or as close to as perfect closer knowledge. Closer to, much closer to where we are, hopefully. Yeah. That's... So that's the biggest, you know, the biggest problem. In our industry, um, the most valuable people are those who are strong, egotistical, um, successful, but who are also team players. Mm. Um, yeah, this is something that uh, probably I will get chastised on LinkedIn for let's, saying. Let's, yeah, we'll talk but about the, that a little bit But more. The, uh, the Achilles heel is those people who are successful, but are not capable of cooperation, team building, sharing. And the real jewels, from a people point of view, are those people who understand not only that they have to drive and be successful and win, mm -hmm. you know, win is better than losing or coming second, but at the same time can draw in everybody in a cohesive way. That is a very rare talent. That is a very rare talent. And I mean, ego, maybe it's, it's also confidence. It's, when people fall, people. I, well, good, fall, good, good people think? are difficult to manage, right? Which is a dangerous thing to say because average people then think that to be to be good, you have to be difficult. So you you should defeat your own purpose. But but it is true. I mean, good people are difficult to manage. But the good people who, at the same time, can draw in people, cooperate, mm -hmm. you know, bring people together. They are the really, you know, you see it, you walk along the Quasette, for example, mm -hmm. and you see, for example, how the holding companies organize their participation here, and you can see the companies that are more unified, and you can see the companies that are more disunited, that are more, you know, without being specific, you know, people know what I'm talking about. And, you know, at, at a very simple level, you know, why would you turn up here in Cannes if you're trying to integrate the company and create one company in three or four different forms, it doesn't make any sense. That's it. You know, quite apart from the expense mm -hmm. point of view, you multiply the cost and you want to be as efficient as possible, you show up in a disunited way instead of a united way. So one, painting a picture of a vision and having people be able to follow it in a united way. Exactly. Can, I think what you said about the broadening of power yeah. and information is fascinating. 
I, I want to bridge it. On the, by the way, you see it on the client side too. Yeah. If CEOs knew what we see, you know, every CEO says their organization is agile, mm -hmm. is responsive, is, you know, um, is uh, apolitical. Um, wish that was the, no, that may be the exception that proves the rule, but you see disunity, you see politics, you see organizational structure get in the way of execution. Um, so it's, it's not just an agency thing, it's a client thing as well. Absolutely. And I think it's critically important for leaders to understand how customers and other parts of the you know, business are seeing sure. how it looks. Sure. Uh, I, I wanted to bring it to this conversation of also how you, how you look at inclusivity yeah. you know, and how you look at DEI. I think that's a big conversation. Yeah. It's an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you see, I mean, per, perhaps continuing in the same vein, do you see anything there with the broadening of knowledge, connection, how accessibility, well, you, look, uh, do you see that transforming in any significant well, I think unfortunately, way? Unfortunately, well? the, the economic pressures and efficiency pressures at the moment are pushing purpose back. You know, you see it in climate change. You know, I was stuck on the runway in London, I didn't get into Cannes at three o'clock in the morning because of thunderstorms in Europe and some of the extreme weather we're getting, obviously, as a result of climate change. But all that is being pushed, not on the back burner, but pushing backwards. From a diversity point of view, you know, we as a company with our close to 9,000 people, we're 40% or thereabouts people of color, uh, very strong Hispanic, in America, we're, we're Amer America's dominated. About seventy percent of our business is in North and South America. Hispanic, we we are strong. Asian American, we're strong. Our black community is not as strong as it would be. We've committed to be to represent the communities in which we operate. So in the U.S., it should be thirteen percent. We're running at about six or seven. Okay. That might be okay in California, but it's not okay in New York with twenty-five percent. Mm -hmm. So clearly, that's one thing. The second thing is we're gender balanced, mm -hmm. but we're underpowered from a female point of view at the high levels of management. So that, that drops to about a third at high levels of management. That's a, clearly an issue. So we put in our, our, we're working with the historically black universities like Howard and Spellman mm -hmm. on an intern program, small scale, but you know, taking a step forward. And we're trying to work, we will be expanding that into the public schools, into the high Amazing. schools, into high school. Well, it, I think How it's really... How does that, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's not easy, work? it's not easy. Um, but I think it's something that we've got to continue to do, to do. I mean, there's a really interesting program in the UK amongst, I think it's called the 10,000 Black Interns mm -hmm. Program, which is amongst the financial community on a much smaller scale. It was after the murder of George Floyd, we, mm -hmm. we decided we had to do something of, Thing. So that's one thing. And then with uh, University College uh, Berkeley, we have our S4 Women's Leadership Program, which is to try and up the ante, if you like, on women leadership. So those two areas, from our point of view, we have to, I mean, I think we, we are very diverse, but we need to be more so. Yeah. Uh, for the obvious reason, it's good business. Women are actually, I'm going to get shot for saying this, but women are probably better in our in our industry than men they have more mm. eq you're welcome to say whatever you'd like <laughs> to say sir <laughs> so so you go back to mm -hmm. a long time ago charlotte beers and shelley lazarus were good examples mm -hmm. of women who who reached the pinnacle in our industry very different styles between the two of them but they were really really strong okay. leaders okay wonderful thank you for for sharing a little bit more about that um Last question I want to ask yeah. you is just to help paint the picture of the future, and then we'll, we'll sure. wrap up. But so, how do you see the future of advertising conglomerates, given your experience? Is it should it change? How will it change? Well, WPP is no longer the biggest. So when I left, it was. It's now number four. So you have Publicis and Omnicom capitalized at about 19 billion, IPG at 15, WPP languishing in fourth place at at uh, about 12 billion. And then you have Dentsu at about seven or eight, and then Havas has disappeared into Vivendi. Um, 
my own view is that our model, you know, it, it, that holding company model goes back to the 1950s and Marion Harper and IPG. People forget that. So it's a 70-year-old model. It doesn't work anymore. Mm. So we think a digitally driven, you know, digital is 65% of the 900 billion media spend. It's going to be 75% by 2025. It's growing faster this year at 7% and analog is going backwards. Uh, so digital is where it is. Data driven, as I said, faster, better, cheaper and more and a unitary structure. We think that model is the model that will benefit from the AI, AGI revolution that we're about to go through. Mm -hmm. Uh, and will become the, that's where we will get concentration and that's where we'll get conversion at scale with clients because it's a model that is much more attuned to what's happening in the world. So the multi-branded model with scads of people in scads of countries doesn't work. You, you know, we're in 32 countries. I doubt whether we'll go to much more than about maybe 35 or 40 mm -hmm. because the technology enables you to hub much more effectively. And then going back to AI and AGI, do we need you know, 130 or 200,000 people? The answer is no. A 9,000 people motor torpedo boat is better than a 100,000 people aircraft carrier because that builds overheads at various levels. So that's where I think the future is. And clients have to do three things. They have to be more agile. They have to take back control of a lot of the marketing functions. Very strange coming from an agency guy, I know, right? Like these, the know. model, there are model, there are three models. There's the embedded model where we put people into clients. There's the outsource model and the in-house model. And we're not frightened to work with clients on housing activities, on media or content if we think it's in their interest to do, right? So they have to do agility. They have to take back control. And the other thing they have to focus on is first party data. The deprecation of cookies control and first party, party data. data. Those are the three yeah. key, key See, things. See, folks, you heard it here. <laughs> the evolution of the advertising industry from someone who well, played which a, is a, wrestling a, with it. Rest, wrestling someone with who's it. wrestling with it and who yeah. also played a massive role. Well, we're trying. No, I wouldn't say that, but we're trying hard. Okay. <laughs> okay. A okay. for effort. Fair enough. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. I Thank appreciate you, you taking you. the time. And I'm glad to take you out of the, the basement. Yes, it's that good you were to. It's nice for to. Two days. <laughs> Ty was in <laughs> the basement for two days. <laughs> Creative judging. B2B Lions judging, folks. <laughs> great. Yeah. Great. It was great work. Okay. Glad Why to be can't here with you. Judging on some sort of rooftop. We were, with the we were sky. discussing that, perhaps judging on the beach. You can help us advocate I for that. I think you'd that judge way. much better if you had a better I, environment. I think so. I think so. <laughs> All right. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>